We want to remind our listeners that this program is for informational and educational purposes only and not intended to substitute for professional veterinary medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. The Animal Medical Center does not recommend or endorse any products or services advertised by SiriusXM. Welcome to Ask the Vet with Dr. Ann Hohenhaus. This is the place to talk about your pets and get advice with a top veterinarian from the Animal Medical Center in NYC. Hear from the leading authorities on animals and ask your questions. Now, here's your host, Dr. Ann Hohenhaus. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today, and welcome to Ask the Vet podcast, a program for people who love pets. I'm Dr. Ann Hohenhaus. I'm a senior veterinarian and director of pet health information at the Schwarzman Animal Medical Center in New York City. Thanks so much for joining me today. Today's a really special day. First of all, we have a great guest, my colleague Nancy Patsos, who's the chief veterinary technician at the Schwarzman Animal Medical Center. But personally, for me, this is an extra special day because this is the first time that I'm back in the Sirius studio since before the pandemic. Um, So it was really great to see my producer, Katie, today, who we've had a Zoom relationship for like three years now. Um, Good news is she looks exactly the same as before the pandemic. In October, second week of October, is the time when the veterinary community recognizes and celebrates veterinary technicians for the critical work that they perform each and every day. And so that's why I have Nancy Patsos as my guest today. Uh, Nancy's worked at AMC for over 20 years in different departments, caring for countless animals. And so there's going to be a lot to talk about and stories to share. So I'm looking forward to our conversation in just a few minutes. I hope you'll stay tuned. Thanks to AMC's longtime partnership with SiriusXM, the Ask the Vet podcast can be accessed on the Sirius app and across all major podcast platforms and also via AMC's website, which is amcny.org. We hope you'll like and follow this podcast to stay current on important pet health information, and I'd appreciate it if you take a moment to give us a review. Another thing you can do is you can ask a question, because this is Ask the Vet. And so if you'd like to ask us a question, you can email us at this very clever email, which is askthevet at amcny.org. And if you don't have a pen or pencil right now, when we take a break, you can get one. And I'll give that email address later on in the show. That email address is if you have a non-urgent question about your pet's health that you want me to answer on the show. But if your pet has an emergency, of course, go to the nearest animal ER. The Schwarzman Animal Medical Center has an extra special emergency room because we're the only level one veterinary trauma center in New York City and the largest not-for-profit animal hospital in the world. Now it's time for our trending animal of the month. It's time for the internet's most talked about animal. So a big black bear decided he needed to get away and climbed on board a catamaran that was tied up at the Naples Sailing and Yacht Club in Naples, Florida. Local Todd Dillman saw the bear as he pushed a barge into the bay, and he said, we get saltwater crocs, alligators, and sharks, but I've never seen anything like this before, and I'm thinking I'm not ever going to see it again either. The bear just hung out on the boat. He went to the front. He went to the back. He went from the bow. He went to the stern. Back and forth. The the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission responded and said the bear was probably just looking for food that had been left on the boat. If you want to see the bear on the boat in Naples, Florida, just Google bear on a boat in Naples, Florida. And I think that that this is a really good reminder that the Florida uh, Wildlife and Game Commission were the folks that came to rescue this particular bear. And that's a, a hint to all of you out there who find creatures, critters, little furry feathered things that seem to be injured or not where they're supposed to be. Um, Your veterinarian is not always the best person to handle wildlife, and you should consider calling your state's wildlife or game commission to help you figure out what's best to do with those wild animals that need some sort of care. So today I want to welcome my guest and colleague, Nancy Patsos, AMC's Chief Veterinary Technician at the Schwarzman Animal Medical Center. Nancy has a big job. She's responsible for management of the veterinary technician workforce and the related patient care services, 
which includes oversight of the licensed veterinary technician directors and managers, licensed veterinary technicians, veterinary assistants, and the clinical educators. NANCHI ensures compliance with patient safety standards, fosters the professional growth of licensed veterinary technicians and the assistants, and manages quality improvement of patient care across all services. And in addition, she assists in strategic planning for the hospital. A technician with over 20 years of experience, she's been at AMC since 2001 and holds two bachelor's degrees, one in veterinary technology from Mercy College, which for those of you who don't know is just a little north of New York City in Westchester County, and one in anthropology from Hunter College, which Hunter College is just up the street from the Animal Medical Center. Hi, Nancy. So glad you could join me today on ASAVET to celebrate National Veterinary Te Technician Week. Hi, Anne. Thank you for having me. So I want to start at the very beginning here. Um, what led you to a career in veterinary technology? Or, or maybe the question should be, how would you bail on anthropology and get into veterinary medicine? Oh, interesting. Um, yes, I grew up on a dairy farm in the Finger Lakes area of upstate New York. So I was surrounded by all types of animals, including cows, pigs, horses, several cats and dogs. I always had a love for animals, but never really considered working in the veterinary field until I volunteered at the Schwartzman Animal Medical Center in 1997. Having an anthropology degree, I was interested in behavior. So, um, you know, volunteering at the Schwartzman Animal Medical Center, I figured I would be observing animals, which, you know, we are all as humans, animals. And that's how I interpreted it. So, but however, when once I started working or volunteering here, it's when I learned about licensed veterinary technicians, which um, is essentially nurses for animals. So I ended up enrolling in the veterinary technology program at Mercy College, did my externship at AMC, and I never left. So for our listeners, the anthropology link is really interesting. In a class that I've been taking, we are talking about teaching and learning. And it turns out that anthropologists have a lot to offer to help us understand how we learn. And one of my favorite papers we read in that class was a team of doctors was followed around by an anthropologist who recorded teaching and learning behaviors that went on. And it was really interesting to look at at teaching and learning, not from like facts and numbers and, and things, but from how it happens. And so yeah. I have a real appreciation for anthropologists from that particular paper that we read in class. Interesting. Yes. So you clearly grew up with pets, but did you have to milk cows early in the morning? Oh, absolutely. Um, and yep. does somebody in your family still have the dairy farm? Unfortunately, no. It was a family farm and, you know, um, just didn't do well eventually, you know, and as family farms have kind of phased out these days. And but um, I have very fond memories. Dairy farming has changed tremendously in, in New York State. When I went to veterinary school, the average dairy farm in New York State had 50 head of cows, which is kind of like a barn full of cows, you know, 25 on either side of the main aisle. And that would be a typical family farm. Do you know how many cows your parents milked? Yeah, we had 80 milking cows and, yeah. you know, so approximately 120, including, you know, young stock and 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 milking cows. Yeah. And, and so now dairy farms in New York State are like gigantic thousands, thousands of yes. cows. Uh -huh. uh, it's completely different than a barn where it was like Bessie and Daisy and Flora. You know, everybody right. knew the name of the cow. I, we knew every name. That's true. And, and you knew which cow was the other cow's mother in the barn, too. Right. Um, oh, yes. I know. I miss those days. I, I the smell of a barn. I love the smell of a dairy barn. Um, <laughs> and you know where you are in a dairy barn by how it smells. Like the milk room smells <laughs> different than the barn, which is different than where the hay is stored upstairs in the hay loft. That's All right. Well, true. anyways, I could talk about dairy farms forever. Um, so in the intro, I said that you've been at AMC for 20 years and you've had a bunch of different roles, uh, emergency critical care tech, a uh, team leader in emergency critical care, and now as your current role as chief veterinary technician. Can you 
tell our listeners what this has been like and, and some of your most memorable experiences. Sure. I was hired at the Schwartzman Animal Medical Center out of my externship as an ward nurse. And at that time, you were either a ward nurse or you worked in the surgery area as an anesthesia nurse. As a ward nurse, I rotated through the different areas of the hospital treating inpatients. This gave me an insight into various levels of patient care needed for stable to unstable hospitalized patients. I quickly developed a passion for emergency and critical care, which was the ICU and the ER. Working in the ER, you never knew what you were going to walk into when you were triaging a patient. It could be a dog with a broken toenail to a serious trauma case, such as a cat that fell from the sixth floor apartment window. The next day you may be scheduled in the ICU where you would be the nurse for that patient and treat it throughout its hospitalization. As the AMC developed, nurses were assigned to specialties. So I quickly applied to be a part of the emergency and critical care team. In 2009, I became certified as a veterinary technician specialist in emergency and critical care. I enjoyed mentoring and training new technicians and became a team leader where I honed my leadership skills. When the nurse manager position became available, I applied and I became involved in all aspects of the hospital, which with a focus on improving career paths for LVTs and assistants. I collaborated with the other nurse managers, sat on several cross-functional committees, became heavily involved in recruitment and retention while making sure that all the needs of the department were met. Eight years later, I applied and was offered the new role of chief veterinary technician. It has been an incredible journey, being able to care for animals and work with brilliant, compassionate, and talented people. I truly believe it is a labor of love, which fulfills both an intrinsic and professional part of me. I believe the future will be fruitful and continue to be rewarding. So what's some of the great cases that you've seen uh, come through our ER? Great cases. That stand out in your mind? Well... I can think of one that in particular, there was a dog that was playing with a stick and unfortunately became impaled in his chest and it was brought immediately to the ER and it was discovered that was right in its carotid artery. So there was no way to just obviously take the stick out. So we had to like just about every doctor specialist that we could think of came to the ER, such as you know, obviously surgeon, the criticalist, the neurologist. It was amazing. It was just all of this collaboration in one room. It was just like a symphony of of specialists right there at our fingertips. And it just, it made you realize what an amazing place this was, that this could all happen and so quickly. And that animal's life was saved. Did you have to tie off the carotid artery to get the stick out without having the dog bleed a lot? Yeah, right there. They, I think they, they just, they had to do it right there in the emergency room. Um, which is shocking to me, but you can tie off a carotid artery and the, the patient has enough extra blood supply elsewhere that, that they can live with a tied off carotid artery. And so then once it all got tied off, then the stick could get removed without having the patient bleed to death. Um, Mm -hmm. But if you just pulled it out, I think it, you know, but then you say, how in the world did that happen? Um, Although today there's an x-ray of a dog that ate a battery uh, and another x-ray of a turtle that seems to have what looks like part of a necklace in it. So we see the craziest things at AMC. Um, I think it's because so many things come in you know, ER, I believe, the emergency room sees about 25,000 patient visits a year. And that's the potential for 25,000 torn toenails to 25,000 sticks in the carotid artery. I mean, and it, it runs the gamut of that. So in, in all this craziness of sticks in carotid arteries and chains in turtles, um, why stay? So, well... There are obvious reasons that I have been at AMC for as long as I have, such as the standard of care that AMC provides. The fact that it is the only level one trauma center in the tri-state area, the diversity of our teams, and that I learn something new every day. Which brings me to an even bigger reason, which is a career development and utilization of the LVTs at AMC. 
and being a part of the growth and development of the profession. Also, it is my love of New York and that AMC serves the New York community, its pets, its owners, and the amazing employees. So your title as chief veterinary technician is not a very common one. Most hospitals don't have a, a chief veterinary officer. Uh, so what does a day look like for you? Well, a typical day starts out by riding my bike to work. I like to come in early every day about 7 a.m. so that I can walk around and say hello to the overnight nurses and the assistants. I'll check in with the morning staff to see if there's anything I can do to help. I will often go for a short run before I begin the rest of the day. I work with key team members across the organization to improve patient care, job satisfaction, and further elevate AMC's reputation. I am committed to upholding the regulatory requirements of the veterinary profession, and I spend a lot of time supporting employee recruitment and retention. Therefore, I do spend a lot of time in meetings. When I get home at night, I try to do something creative like painting with watercolors or work on a project such as reupholstering a chair. Basically, my day isn't only about the work I do at AMC, but finding a balance between my creative, physical, and intellectual mind. I believe taking care of myself allows me to take care of my team at AMC. So offline, we're going to need to talk about that chair that needs reupholstering because I got this one in my living room that's really pretty threadbare. And I could, you know, after a while, you're going to run out of chairs in your house. And I have some chairs in my house um, yes. that that could use uh, somebody to do something with it. And, and I'll be happy to help, but I, I have no talent in that arena whatsoever. So stay tuned on that one. So I think a lot of people don't really know what a veterinary technician is. And so state by state and country by country, there are different names for the role that the people who work for you fulfill. So I was just in Europe where they're very commonly called veterinary nurses. And in New York, we call them licensed veterinary technicians, but in some places they're called technologists and other places there, there are other things like California has a different name as well. So tell our listeners what this important part of the veterinary healthcare team does. Well, an LVT at AMC requires astute assessment skills and flexibility. Each specialty has its own requirements for expert technical skills, a strong and current knowledge base pertaining to disease, pathophysiology, and drug pharmacology. These skills can range from triaging patients through the emergency room to running our MRI or CT scans. The nurses do anesthesia for surgeries and procedures. They place IV central lines. They perform dialysis. They can interpret ECGs, manage patients on ventilators, and much more. LVTs support the staff, doctors, residents, and interns during appointments, procedures, and treatment plans for their patients. They are also very much involved in client education. At AMC, LVTs cross-train and work with different specialties and learn additional skills that way. So... I'll just add to that a little bit that that the nurses that I work with on a day to day basis in oncology give they they're the ones who give all the chemotherapy and they also run our laboratory equipment. Different different groups of doctors have different special pieces of laboratory equipment. Yes, AMC has a big lab on the fifth floor that does the the lion's share of lab work, but but then there are little special machines in a bunch of different places in the hospital so that we can get special results, fast results, um, particular to the, the team of doctors that uses that particular equipment. Now, in one of your prior answers, you kind of hinted to career development of veterinary technicians. So the Schwarzman Animal Medical Center recently induced a veterinary technician career ladder to help with career advancement and their new roles such as managers and clinical directors. Can you talk about why this career ladder is so important um, to nurses? Sure. AMC has expanded the opportunities given to LVTs over the years, though recently with the realization that there were not many opportunities to advance as an LVT, having limited team leaders and manager positions, we decided to implement an extended career ladder. 
There are now more positions available, which give LVTs an opportunity to move up in leadership roles, such as LVT directors, managers, team leaders, administrators on duty, and preceptors. Soon, we plan to implement the advanced practice LVT role for the advancement of professional clinical practice, much like a nurse practitioner. So one thing you didn't mention in that is something that you are, which not a lot of technicians are at AMC, and that is a, um, you're a board certified technician. Can you talk a smidge about that? Sure. Pretty much every specialty has what we call vet tech specialists, which I am vet tech specialist in emergency and critical care. I have it for internal medicine, oncology, anesthesia, dentistry. It is something that you can work toward as an individual to become an expert in your specialty. You basically have to apply and do case studies and submit them and be approved. And then you can sit for a national board exam. Which is not easy, is my understanding about that. You know, it's a two-year process. I mean, just the application process is a year, and then you have to wait for the following year to sit for that exam. And do they require you to have a certain number of years of experience in, say, emergency critical care before you can even apply. Yes, you have to at least be, in emergency critical care, it's three years. So so it's really like a five-year process minimum, three years of experience, a year to apply, and then a year to take the test if, if they are so kind as to let you pass the first time. Correct. At AMC, we have a, an, an education department, which um, we have clinical educators that will assist LVTs to get through that process. Which you need both technical support on how to do that and then also emotional support because it's, it's, not, a, it's like not a fun process. It's, no. it's fun when it's over and you feel like you've really accomplished something, but the process itself is, is really a, a pain in the butt. So to celebrate National Technician Week, AMC is presenting its inaugural veterinary technician conference starting October 13th at Weill Cornell Medical Center. And as of this conversation between Nancy and I, there are 125 confirmed attendees, which is terrific for like the first go round. Can you talk a little bit details about this conference? Yes, I'm very excited that AMC is sponsoring our very first LVT Continuing Education Conference to kick off National Veterinary Technician Week. We will host lectures by four of AMC specialists, including criticalists, Dr. Anne Marie Zolo, who will lecture on triage of the veterinary patient, neurologist, Dr. Dan Samino, lecturing on recognition, stabilization, monitoring, and the care of the traumatic brain injury patient, exotic specialist, Dr. Cindy Brown, will lecture on onboarding with common small mammal patients. Internist Dr. Doug Palma's lecture will be Getting Blood from a Stone, History Taking of Internal Medicine. The conference includes lunch with our keynote speaker, Rachel Herman, the founder and executive director of PAUSE New York. Following the lectures, there will be a cocktail reception between four and six. LVTs must register for the conference. However, if You are not available for the entire day. You can register for individual lectures. It is a great opportunity for LVTs to obtain free CE and network with other LVTs. We hope that this is the first of many continuing education conferences to come. I think it's going to be a great opportunity for people to get together, especially since there's not been that much in-person education opportunities since the pandemic. And we're, everybody's slowly coming back to seeing people in person. So this is going to be a terrific opportunity. So if, if any techs are out there and you hear this before October 13th, sign up. Uh, is there a sign up on our website? On the website, there's all types of places to sign up, register on Instagram, Facebook, follow us, and you'll see the invite 
So AMC's Instagram is at AMCNY. Facebook is The Animal Medical Center. And Twitter is at AMCNY as well. I want to take this opportunity to thank my very special guest, Nancy Patsos, and to thank all the veterinary technicians out there for the hard work they do in supporting veterinarians and taking care of the pets that we love. Thanks so much, Nancy, for joining me today on Ask the Vet. Well, thank you. It's been my pleasure. I hope you'll take a moment to email me with your question about your pet's health. That email is askthevet at amcny.org, and I'll answer your question on next month's Ask the Vet podcast. We've got to take a brief break, but I hope you'll stay tuned because we've got animal news when we return. We're back with Dr. Ann Hohenhaus on Ask the Vet. Call now with your pet questions on Sirius XM Stars. Welcome back to Ask the Vet. And now it's time for the animal news. It's time for animal headlines. The biggest animal news from across the world. Our first story comes from India in South Asia. A young stray dog being chased by a pack of feral dogs ended up trying to escape by jumping into the Savitri River. But the pup didn't realize as there were three adult crocodiles floating close by. According to the experts, the crocodiles were so close to the dog they could have easily devoured it. But when their snouts came in contact with the dog, they wound up saving the dog's life instead of having it for lunch. The crocodiles guided the dog away from where the pack of dogs were waiting for it on the riverbank, and they used their snouts to nudge the pup further upriver so he could get back up on the bank and safely escape. This amazing situation was described in a report in the Journal of Threatened Taxa by scientists who spent years studying marsh crocodiles, otherwise known as muggers, They report the dog was seen being given safe passage by the three crocodiles in a behavior that's suggestive of cross-species empathy. For more info and photos, just Google Croc saving a dog in India. The second story comes from Australia. A family was traveling by car in the southern part of Australia and stopped to help a kangaroo that had been hit by a car. And I just want you to know that having been to Australia a couple of times, hit by car kangaroos are unfortunately an all too common situation. The family realized it was too late to help the mother kangaroo, but they found a tiny snow white joey safe in her pouch and quickly called local kangaroo rescue for help. Now a joey is the name of a baby kangaroo, just like a baby dog is a puppy, well, a baby kangaroo is a joey. So when the folks from the Adelaide Hills Kangaroo Rescue Group arrived on the scene, they were speechless because albino kangaroos, which is what this little joey was, are very rare. About one in a hundred thousand chance of finding a albino joey kangaroo. So the rescue group named her Winnie and she settled into her life at the shelter with other orphaned kangaroos. And Winnie now resides at the Kangaroo Pouch Animal Orphanage, where expert staff make sure she gets all the care she needs for her unique condition, including health monitoring and kangaroo safe sunscreen. Now, I looked at the pictures of Winnie, the albino kangaroo, and what she really looks like is a white rabbit, except she's a kangaroo, but her color is the same, like her nose is really pink and her eyelids are really pink and her ears are really pink and she has no pigment so she really can't go out in the Australian sun because she would like burn and blister in a heartbeat hence why they need to give her kangaroo safe sunscreen and will probably need to keep her in a a more shady area than the typical outback for kangaroos if you want to see pictures of Winnie the albino kangaroo for yourself just google Winnie the albino kangaroo because she really is cute as a button And our last story is closer to home, comes from Inglewood, California, where thousands of Metallica fans gathered together in SoFi Stadium for a concert. And there was this beautiful German Shepherd who was enjoying the music and having a really good time. There's a photo of her sitting in a seat watching the band, and that photo went viral. 
turns out the dog wasn't there with any humans. The concert staffers were worried that it had been abandoned at the stadium, so they made an arrangement to place her in a shelter. But wait. According to Metallica's Facebook page, the dog's name is Storm, and she lives nearby, and she snuck out of the house and walked to the stadium. And although she spent the night at the animal shelter, she was reunited with her family the next day. So if you want to see pictures of Storm, the dog at the Metallica concert, just Google dog at the Metallica concert to see her sitting in her seat and enjoying the music. And now it's one of my favorite times of the show, and that is it's time for questions from our listeners. Our first question comes from Pasquale in Massachusetts. He writes, he has a nine-year-old tabby named Noah that has kidney problems. Their vet recommended a KD diet by prescription. He read the article and would like to know how well that diet works and are there any studies indicating the results of the diet? How does it extend the pet's life and how long does it take before it begins to work? AMC is the best and he's been a client over the years. Well, Pasquale, thank you so much for your support of AMC. So I want to start by saying that therapeutic diets, or we'll call them kidney-friendly diets, don't reverse the fact cats like Noah's kidneys don't work so well anymore. The idea behind the kidney-friendly diets is they decrease the workload of the kidneys. So kidney-friendly diets have lower protein, lower phosphorus, and lower sodium because the ailing kidneys cannot excrete these substances well. Kidney-friendly diets also have high potassium, since the ailing kidneys excrete excessive amounts of potassium, and a pet with kidney disease is often got a low blood potassium level that makes them feel kind of logy and sluggish. So that's just one aspect of managing chronic kidney disease in cats. Your cat will need regular veterinary visits to be sure that the kidney-friendly diet is providing adequate calories and that Noah's weight stays at a good weight level. Your veterinary needs to evaluate whether Noah is adequately hydrated. Sometimes we add fluids under the skin to cats who are, are chronically dehydrated. Anemia is another problem that we see with chronic kidney disease, and so your veterinarian will monitor the level of anemia and give medications to counteract that if necessary. And finally, we always monitor the calcium in cats with kidney disease because sometimes that kind of creeps up as the kidneys decrease in their ability to work. So a kidney-friendly diet is important in managing kidney disease, but there's a multifactorial process to manage this disease. And you need to check in with your veterinarian frequently to make sure that every treatment that Noah is receiving has been optimized for the best. Good luck to you and um, Noah, and we hope that we'll see both of you at the Animal Medical Center soon. Our next email comes from Mary about her brother's senior Jack Russell Terrier dog. Mary writes, um, the dog who had surgery last year to remove a malignant tumor in her neck. Then about two months ago, his dog stopped eating and a mass was felt in her spleen. My questions are, what test should be done? What's the prognosis after spleen surgery? Is there a quality of life post-surgery? And what's the average lifespan following this surgery? So, Mary, I'm sorry about your brother's dog, who sounds like had a very good surgery to remove the malignant tumor in the neck last year. Now, this spleen thing, can a mass in the spleen can range from a benign mass to a highly malignant and potentially fatal mass. So... The first thing to do is to have the Jack Russell Terrier evaluated for potential surgery. And if the pre-surgery analysis checks out okay, then we typically remove the spleen. And that spleen then is submitted for a biopsy. Dogs and cats do very well without their spleens. And so just removing the spleen does not change a dog's quality of life. What changes the dog's quality or quantity of life is what that spleen biopsy shows. Obviously, if it's a benign tumor in the spleen, then 
the dog is cured of that problem. And some malignant tumors of the spleen require chemotherapy and other tumors of the spleen. If you just take the spleen out, um, the pet does very well on a long-term basis. So the it's not the splenectomy that's the problem or the spleen removal. It's whether or not that spleen is malignant. And it's very hard to know that until the spleen is removed from the dog. So best of luck to the Jack Russell Terrier who's about to have his spleen removed. Fingers crossed that the biopsy is a good one. Our next question comes from Trish. Trish writes that her 11 and a half year old pit mix named Jazz had a blood panel. Yeah, she writes, Jazz had a senior blood panel done and it showed high liver enzymes. The panel was repeated with the same results and a sonogram showed no tumors or nothing crazy going on. My vet didn't think it was Cushing's disease because Jazz didn't have any of the other symptoms, excessive drinking, urination. Trish is deeply concerned but doesn't know what other route to take and would like to know if you can suggest any next steps. So um, Cushing's disease doesn't always come with the other clinical signs that Trish describes, the excessive drinking and urinating. Um, I've seen a few dogs and their, their major problem was their blood pressure was up. So I think it's when you have liver tests that are elevated, it's always reasonable to look at a screening test for Cushing's disease. Trish might also want to have her dog screened for thyroid disease because occasionally you'll see elevated liver tests with thyroid disease. And if the liver enzymes uh, continued to creep up, then maybe a liver biopsy is in order. If the liver enzymes over time kind of stay the same and an ultrasound in, say, another two, three months doesn't show anything, then I might be less worried about what's going on. But I think some hormone testing for thyroid and Cushing's disease is reasonable and monitor those liver enzymes and make sure they're not creeping up, in which case a liver biopsy sounds like a really good idea. Best of luck uh, to Trish and Jazz. Uh, let us know how things go. Our last question today comes from Sam. Sam has a five-year-old seven-pound Pomeranian who is in good health, but he has developed alopecia. Many people say that vitamin D3 is great for skin and fur. I have purchased liquid vitamin D3. What do you suggest in terms of daily dosage of vitamin D3 in IU measurement, which I need to give him? Also, how much sunbathing is enough for him? Is 15 minutes of sunbathing enough or too much? Thanks for your time. So the first thing is that uh, Pomeranians and other very thick-coated dogs develop this hair loss problem called alopecia, and no one really knows what causes it. There's a lot of theories out there. But I would be very hesitant to give vitamin D to any patient because vitamin D is a, a vitamin that, if given too much of, can cause very high levels of blood calcium, and that can be quite dangerous. So I can't recommend a dose for uh, the five-year-old seven-pound Pomeranian because this is not my patient and I can't prescribe for patients. And I'd be very hesitant to think that this was a good treatment for a, any dog, uh, not just this dog who's got a hair problem. The question about sunbathing, um, this dog does not have its protective hair coat. So dogs do fine usually out in the sun because their hair protects the skin underneath. But since this little guy has lost his hair, I would be very worried about any sun exposure in this dog because of the the risk of sunburn. Uh, dogs don't very often get sunburn because they have a hair coat that protects their skin. So I would be sure that this little palm, when it goes outdoors, has on a little t-shirt uh, or a little outfit to keep the sun off of it. And they actually do make um, SPF protective clothing for dogs. Uh, and that would be a really good thing to put on this dog when it goes outside. So I'm afraid that I can't really give 
a lot of good advice to this Pomeranian and would suggest maybe that the owner wants to seek the opinion of a board-certified veterinary dermatologist. You can find a board-certified veterinary dermatologist by going to American College of Veterinary Dermatology and go to their website, and they will be able to, on the website, find a dermatologist near me. And I think that's really the best thing that could be done for the little palm. Uh, best of luck, and I hope that the little guy gets hair back very soon. And now it's time to take a break. And when we come back, we'll have news from the Animal Medical Center. We're back with Dr. Ann Hohenhaus on Ask the Vet. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Ask the Vet. We have news from the Animal Medical Center now. Halloween is just around the corner, and so many pet parents are going to be celebrating with their furry family members. But Halloween can actually be stressful, frightening, and dangerous for family pets. And those dangers range from food that are toxic like chocolate and raisins to the costumes that the people are wearing or the costumes we decide to put on our pets. So the folks at AMC's Used An Institute for Animal Health Education make the following recommendations about pet costumes at Halloween time. They're adorable. I will confess, I have the cutest lion head costume that I can put on kittens, and it fits right over their head, and it makes them look exactly like Bert Lahr in as the cowardly lion in Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz. I mean, it is adorable. They hate it. And so that's a really important thing about costumes for pets at Halloween. You need to prioritize safety and comfort over style and cuteness. And so if you're going to dress up your dog or cat, keep these tips in mind from our friends at the Used and Institute. First, make sure the costume fits properly and doesn't interfere with sight, hearing, breathing, or movement. Avoid costumes with pieces that can be tripped over, chewed off, or tangled up and, you know, snag on something and keep the dog from being able to move around. Always supervise your pet when they're dressed up in their costume. When you put the costume on, the collar and tag may seem extraneous, but they, it is not. If your pet gets scared by people wearing weird masks or scary pumpkins or something, your dog could run away. And so be sure that the dog collar and ID tag are on underneath their costume. If you've got a really furry dog, then you don't want some hot, heavy costume. Pick some lightweight ensemble to prevent them from overheating. Don't forget to do a dress rehearsal. A week or so before Halloween, put on the costume and see if your pet even wants to wear it. And if they really reject the costume, or in some cases act paralyzed because they've got on this costume, it may take a couple of tries before your pet decides it's okay. But if your pet really goes crazy in the costume, then just know it, it is not the right thing to do for your pet. So I hope everyone has a great time at Halloween, but be careful with those pet costumes. The other thing to be careful at Halloween is pumpkins with candles, real candles in them or candles that are out because your pet doesn't know that they shouldn't get close to those candles and their costume can catch on fire or your pet can catch on fire. So just watch out for candles this time of year. Now, cat lovers, we've got something great coming up for you. Did you know that domestic cats have evolved from origins in the African desert and have transformed to one of the most successful and diverse species on our planet? To hear more about this topic, I hope that you'll join us at the Usdan Institute on Thursday, October 27th for our conversation with scientist and cat enthusiast Jonathan Lussos, author of The Cat's Meow, How Cats Evolved from the Savannah to Your Sofa. Dr. Lozos explores how researchers today are unraveling the secrets of the cat, past and present. And they're using tools of modern technology, so this is going to be a fascinating discussion. As usual, this is a free online event hosted via Zoom, but you need to register because we can't send you the Zoom link if we don't know you want to come. 
To get more details, go to our website, which one more time is amcny.org backslash USDAN events. At the USDAN Institute for Animal Health Education, you also have free access to pet health articles, upcoming pet health events, video tutorials, and other pet parent educational resources. And you just need to go to amcny.org and put in you 